welcome to one more class and this one is about color i want to talk about color because it's something that i'm really really passionate about color is one of my favorite topics it's really exciting you can do so much with it if you know the science behind color and that's why i want to um, teach you guys some things talk about some things and clear up some misconceptions that you may have about color let's start with what are the primary colors primary colors are something that we learned um, when we were in elementary school, right? So the primary colors you're probably familiar with are yellow, red, and blue. Red, yellow, and blue are primary colors that were found for the first time by Sir Isaac Newton. So he was doing some experiments using prisms and sunlight to try to figure out um, how colors were organized or if there was a way to organize colors. And he um, figured out um, that you could organize colors in a color wheel, and it was basically an, an infinite color wheel. And he was the first one that actually put them together. And he defined that red, yellow, and blue, based on his experiments, were um, primary colors. You could actually mix all the other colors that he was seeing with these three basic colors. The problem with that is that he was so excited. And of course, he made the news. Everybody was talking about it. He just got to the schools, of course. There is a great way now for us to organize color. Red, yellow, and blue are primaries. This is going to be great for us. We don't have to buy so many paint tubes anymore. Buy three plus white and black. We're good to go. So all schools start telling this to their students, right? And the kids were like, okay, red, yellow, and blue. And then frustration started. As it turns out, red, yellow, and blue works if you are painting with light. But in the classroom, we are not painting with light. We are painting with paint, Ooh. right? So, so that was a, a little bit of a problem. Paint has a lot of impurities. Paint is not light at all. Paint works completely different than light. So when book printers started mass producing books in color, they, they realized that when they were using red, yellow, and blue, that of course wasn't going to work. And so graphic designers and book publishers and magazines, everything has changed since um, decades ago. They started using three different colors, which I'm going to show you right, guys right now. So instead of using this color wheel, which is based on the yellow, red, and blue primary colors, they started using cyan, yellow, and magenta, which is CMY. And if you guys have a color printer at home, you know that that's the tubes for your color printer, right? Color printers and even the printer that we have at home and the graphic designers, everybody knows that you can't mix these gorgeous colors here, for instance, you can't mix them with uh, red, blue, and yellow. You just can't get to it. So they've been using cyan, magenta, and yellow for, for a long, long time. The problem is the memo, got lost in the mail and teachers still use red, yellow, and blue everywhere, everywhere. This was years and years of frustration for me. Years, years, long, painful years of frustration. Okay, now that that's out there. This here is the beautiful new updated color wheel based on yellow, cyan, and magenta. So what you're going to notice here is that the color wheel can be divided into warm colors and cool colors. So cool colors are very, very useful for when you're painting winter scenes and that kind of thing. Warm colors if you're doing sunsets and other paintings that are warmer. But also an interesting thing is to, for instance, make your foreground or your figure, or let's say you're painting an apple in red, the thing that is in the forefront of your painting, and then you put the background, the stuff that is in the back, with cool colors, or vice versa. So you can use warm colors and cool colors to play with a painting like that. If you create a whole painting in cool colors, and you have one element in warm colors, let's say you have the whole background in blues and greens, but then you have an apple in the front or something else that is red, that red is going to pop. You can use the contrast between warm and cool colors to create a focal point in your painting. So as you can see, red is right there. So if red was a primary color, for real, because primary colors are colors that you cannot mix, isn't that right? That's what we heard. You can't mix a primary color. Well, there's red. And there's blue. 
the same ultramarine blue. You can get blue by mixing magenta and cyan. So we're back to the slide because I want to point out something that I forgot. Do you guys see this beautiful magenta anywhere here? No. No! This magenta here, I mean, this one here, this rose, maybe it's a little bit close, but magenta is actually a color that you cannot mix with these colors at all. It's just not possible. So there's that. Continuing then, magenta, a real primary color, and cyan, which is right here, they will make all these beautiful colors, including all these gorgeous purples, which are only possible with the new color wheel. Of course, if you like mud, you can always continue using red and blue to make purple. Good luck with that. When you are mixing colors based on red, yellow, and blue, you are not going to get gorgeous purples. Guys, there is no purple on the traditional color wheel. It's not possible to create purple. I spent hours trying to create purple during school, during college, and there's no way to make a nice purple. I like purple so much, I painted my hair purple. Come on. So now that my rant is over, let's continue here. So a hue is actually a color that is pure. It's a pure pigment without anything mixed to it. And it's a very appropriate, correct, and um, informed way of referring to a color. For instance, I love this hue, right? When you say I love this color and I love this hue, hue you're being a little more specific. So hue is a good word. Now you can organize hues into the color wheel as primary, secondary, and tertiary colors. Now, do you have to memorize all these names? No, you don't have to memorize them, but you have to probably know where they are in the color wheel because that will make your life easier, right? It's not that difficult for you to remember where the colors are in the color wheel if you remember the secondary colors, and we'll get there in a second. Now, primary colors, as I mentioned before, they are the most important ones. You can make anything else out of it. You can make beautiful reds out of it, by the way. So red, definitely not a primary, right? Instead of having army green, the greens that I got from the red, yellow, and blue are just disgusting. They look like somebody went into a pond and like scraped the bottom or something. It's nasty. Green is created by yellow and cyan. And red is in the middle of magenta and yellow. And the blue on the bottom is between the magenta and the cyan. Now, if you remember where these are, any other color you can kind of figure out, right? Oh, it's kind of greenish. It must be near the green area. Oh, it's kind of bluish. It must be under here. If it's a reddish with a coolness to it, it's closer to the magenta, closer to the blue because it's a wheel, right? So it's, it's really, um, you can kind of figure out if you remember the secondary colors. So these are the tertiary. There are six tertiary colors and these are made by one primary and one secondary. And after the tertiary, of course, there's like a range, right? It's really a rainbow. So there's this beautiful range. I'm gonna go back here. Here we go. So in between here, you guys, for instance, in between the, the, this orange with this yellow, there's a range, right? In between this yellow and this green, beautiful range. Actually, this is one of my favorite ranges. You can get like these really limey, greeny things. They're all in here, right? So all this, we gotta imagine this really as a range and it's an ever flowing, beautiful circle of color. So analogous colors. Analogous colors are colors that are located close to each other in the color wheel. So if you go back here, if I pick these five here, starting with the magenta, one, two, three, four, five, from here to here, these five here, they're analogous colors. So if I want a painting to look really, really tight and good, Sometimes one of the things that um, artists do is to pick colors that are analogous. They're close to each other. Three or four or five colors that are close to each other in the color wheel. So you pick like these five here, these four here, or you may pick these here, right? I'm going to use only these three here. And then you can play with it. You can pick, let's say I pick these three here. And then I pick the opposite color, right? So I have these three plus an opposite. or these three here plus the opposite and that that creates a difference a different level of vibration but let's go back to the analogous 
So as little as two or three, as much as half the color wheel, but no more, right? So you, you pick like, I, I, I think five is, is really a good number. And um, you can look here at this um, sunflowers, right? Tournesols by um, Van Gogh, uh, how beautiful it turned out and how limited his palette is. Now, limited palettes are very powerful, right? If you have a, a painting that has every single color out there, it's not going to be such a powerful image as something that is more limited and you really thought about what it is that you're, um, that you're putting on, right? So this is, a, this is very much based on yellows and oranges. You can see a little bit of the green. So this here is what he picked. There's a little bit of that red there, but not so much intensity, right? So he reduced the intensity of these colors. Actually, all of these colors are muted. As I was saying, less is more. So better to use five colors regularly, become familiar with their properties, right? Especially in the beginning, picking up a couple colors, like a few colors, limiting your palette and getting really comfortable with those colors is, is sometimes the best way to go. So as you can see, you can do a lot with a limited palette. So, okay, intensity. As I was saying, the Van Gogh painting was not very intense. It was more neutral. He had neutralized the colors. Now, how did he do that? Most likely, he added the opposite color uh, on the color wheel. So what's the opposite color on the color wheel called? So this is the color wheel. The opposite color on the color wheel over here, right, is called a complementary color. How do complementary colors work? So complementary colors are really useful. So you can have a painting that is all on the yellows and the oranges, those kinds of tones. But then you add a little bit of blue, so that pop of, of a color that is on the opposite side of the color wheel, right? And that blue will then vibrate and it will look really, really cool. So that's a, that's a bonus of a complementary color. It does vibrate and it does make it super interesting. And there's a science behind that. We're going to see that in a little bit. Uh, but another good thing about complementary colors is that if you mix them together, they serve um, to neutralize each other. You can mute it. You can mix it a little bit in, a little bit in, and you will mute each other. They will mute each other out, which is really good. Some people use black to mute color out. That's not a very good thing because black is going to muddle the everything. It's going to make everything very boring. But if you use the, co the complementary color of the color that you're trying to, um, to neutralize, then it's going to make it really, really interesting, right? So what is a complementary and why do they look good together? Well, it turns out that our eyes have receptors for different colors that we see because color is really just the light, right? The light is going to, let's say I have here my phone. My phone has a turquoise color. My phone is actually not turquoise. My phone is everything else but turquoise. Uh, it absorbs every other color and it reflects back turquoise. Everything that we see is the same thing. So for instance, this little sharp here, right? There's a magenta top. It is not really magenta. It's actually everything else but magenta. It reflects back the color um, that it cannot, you know, it cannot absorb. So we have receptors in our eyes that capture those colors as they are reflected back. And so this is really interesting. Our eyes try to adjust. There are different cones for different colors and our eyes try to adjust uh, by balancing the color, offering the opposite of that color. So it, it's really interesting. So the reason why complementary colors look so good together is that our brains are expecting that. They're like, oh, please, please, can you um, balance out this yellow with this other uh, color so that I feel good? And so you offer that and then it vibrates together. It's really interesting. So, so we're going to do a little experiment here. I'm going to pop up a ball of color and you're going to stare at it for 20 seconds. We're gonna count it together. Don't move your eyes, try not to blink too much. You're gonna stare at this ball of color and then we're gonna see what you see, okay? All right, everybody. So let's look at the red color and count until 20. 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And now, to stare at the center of the screen, 
and try not to blink and relax your eyes and see what color you see now in the center of the screen. What color are you seeing? You ready? It's probably something like this, isn't it, guys? Something a little bluish, a little light blue. Your brain is trying so, so hard to fill in that space with the opposite of that color. So let's do another experiment. You ready? Chartreuse, one of my favorites. So we're going to go again. 20, 19, 18, 17, 16, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So what color do you see now? Let's take a look. It was probably some variation of this color. A little bit lighter maybe, a little bit more watery, but probably a variation of the purple that we see here, this beautiful violet. So complementary colors, very interesting, very powerful, almost magical, but lots of science behind. Complementary colors, basically, they're located on the opposite side of uh, the color wheel. But really, if you get something from this side and something from this side, even if it's not directly opposite, it will still be amazing, right? But if you really want to use complementaries, they're exactly, exactly opposite. Um, they also help guide your eye through the painting because if a painting is completely blue, like this one here is a lot of blue, you follow that orange because it is so unique and your eye wants it. So you're, you're following that orange around. So this one here is really cool. And you can see the play with intensity as well as complementary colors, right? The intensity here is not that strong. Um, it's actually quite dull, but you can uh, see here where it gets a little more intense, how forward it comes, how it comes. And you can see in your eye goes to the sleeve here. The same thing with the, 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 the grass, right? It's very um, subdued, it's very neutralized. So it goes back, it recedes. So if you look here, right, you can use these high intensity, pure hues to become a focal point on your painting. You decide where the viewer is going to look. If your whole painting has intense, intense, intense color, fully saturated, right? Saturation is when you have a lot of a lot of the pigment in there. If it's fully saturated and very intense, then your viewer is not going to really know where to look, right? Very much. So if you have everything else dulled down here, for instance, if you see here, neutralized colors, it helps them stay on the back, right? And then you get this pop of intense, bright, the reddest red, the brightest yellow, they're all on the forehead of the elephant. So you're looking there. And then your eye starts wandering around with the curve of the trunk and all these things, right? So that's it for our video today. I hope you guys learned some new things. Uh, if you didn't learn some new things, at least it was a good refresher for you because sometimes we do need to listen to the same thing twice or three times before we start getting comfortable with it. And we can use these concepts, right? So um, that's it for today. Love you guys. Miss you guys. And I'll see you soon.